Chat with Traders, episode 159, is brought to you by Birch. Birch is a win, especially for anyone who's heavy-handed with their credit card, but really anyone who uses a credit card, because Birch have discovered the average person misses out on roughly $300 worth of rewards every year. Birch is a new app that will help you to get the most out of your cards and earn more from rewards programs. Download Birch, B-I-R-C-H, in the App Store and sign up for free today. Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Hey ladies and gents, Aaron Fifield here bringing you another installment of the Chat with Traders podcast. My guest on this episode is Greg Newman. He's someone who I was recently introduced to by James King, who you'll remember from episode 133. Uh, James was the performance director with a sports science background at a London trading firm. There, James worked closely with Greg to achieve great breakthroughs in performance as he was building out an oil trading desk and significantly multiplied the firm's profits in just a few years. Of course, Greg has continued as a serious trader of oil derivatives and is now a founding partner of Onyx Commodities. Where Greg and his firm are most active is in oil futures and the energy sector, but also trading in related OTC products, or better known as swaps. You'll find this is quite an interesting topic, and it's something new, not previously covered on other episodes. So you'll hear Greg speaking about futures, swaps, carefully tracking the physical, fundamentals and producers. Really, we spend quite some time on this. Greg also shares a few of his own trading and risk management principles, or as he describes it, trade craft, and how you can use a tried and tested method to overcome obstacles, which was developed by Toyota, the car company. As always, that's just a teaser. There's plenty more coming up right now. Here's Greg Newman for episode 159. So, Greg, I'd be interested to hear a little bit about your actual, your first exposure to trading and markets. Immediately after university, I, I joined a, uh, a physical oil and gas company, uh, Russian. And um, that was only for a few months, but it just gave me a bit of exposure to the physical markets. Um, and I had some understanding kind of baseline from uh, doing an internship at a bank as well, investment bank as well. Um, but it was only really when I got to my first trading job, which was at Mandara, which was about six months after uni, um, when I really started to get a serious market focus and, uh, yeah, specific trading, um, touches on the ball on trading. So when I started Mandara, which is where it was, um, I got this job, it was still in the startup phase. Um, and, you know, we had one particular desk that was doing well, and but a lot of um, junior traders like myself who were coming in and basically supporting the company, but also trying to experiment with uh, small risk and, and try to build the company um, doing that. And uh, so I was one of those guys, and uh, there's lots of opportunities for people who could prove themselves. You know, that's kind of where I thrived. Um, do you want me to go a bit into... Yeah, well, let me ask you, um, so just so we're clear, that, that first job you had where you were working at a physical, uh, an oil company that which dealt with physical, um, that wasn't a trading role in any sense? No, it was um, an analyst role. Uh, it was a business analyst role whereby I would speak to the traders and get their technological requests um, just purely from software and uh, how they wanted to see their risk, etc., and then I would be the commu- I would be the link between um, the front office and tech. So it was my job to understand from a trading point what they needed, and uh, then also understand enough to relay that to the tech team so they could then know what to build. And uh, it seems like not relevant, but it did give me a lot of exposure I wouldn't have got to you know the, the trading floor and what these guys were doing. And you know it all comes down to risk management and uh, a lot of what I was dealing with was the risk systems. So that that is where I 
yeah, I've definitely got some decent exposure and learned quite a bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you would have, especially as you went on to work at Mandara, which, um, I mean, maybe you can shine a little light on this, but uh, from my understanding and from speaking with uh, James King, who was uh, previously on the podcast, who, who uh, worked there up until recently, that's a firm which is purely focused on trading oil, am I right? Yeah, so it's oil uh, derivatives specifically, it was, it was no physical, it's just um, trading the, the derivatives, the futures and um, the swaps market. So uh, everything was linked to uh, ultimately to the futures. Um, when I joined, it was uh, a focus more on the curve arbitrage. So essentially, we were trading, you know, forward prices um, in the OTC market against the futures, you know, you'll kind of see day-to-day Brent WTI, and we're trying to profit essentially from the price dislocations. Uh, so this is what this is where the company started, but um, you know, it was never really something I was particularly passionate about. Um, so I, you know, tried to bring in some kind of fundamental analysis, even though I didn't know a great deal myself. It was quite it was quite novel for the company, and uh, that's where I kind of focused to stand out. Uh, I enjoyed, yeah, from, from my experience um, on the little bit on the physical, but also in general, I just did have a pretty strong interest in the physical side of the market. And uh, I'd heard a lot of the stories about, you know, some of the bigger oil derivatives traders, you know, Pierre Ronderon, Andy Hall, these guys, um, huge hedge funds now, and they you know, have made serious amounts of money. And um, that was kind of how I envisage my life. <laughs> Obviously got a bit of a rude awakening. When I uh, when I started, you know, there's a lot of hard work and a lot of like deep analysis. And my method was to properly analyze the crude market in particular, and crude, you know, being the um, what you actually dig out of the ground. And ultimately, what we sell, what's sold into the rest of the market is the um, is the end user product, you know, gasolines, the diesels, etc. But you know, the, ultimately, the crude fundamentals do uh, do have the biggest say. And I'd say what I was thought I displayed relatively well early on was I didn't want to, I didn't really buy into the kind of generic macro headlines and demand analysis you'll typically see on the internet. You know, a lot of people talk about um, demand forecasts, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, they'll they'll send out these reports. And so will even, you know, the EIA, who are meant to be an official US agency, they will send out these demand forecasts and they're they're total rubbish because they're, they're based on their own models and their own forecasts based on GDP, um, assumptions all over the place. So it just, it, you know, really didn't make sense. What made a lot more sense to me was focusing on the supply side. Um, and the supply side, it would be about reading about the actual um, physical differentials, what prices they were trading at, and looking at the refinery uh, profitability. So what what crudes that ultimately the refiners would, would actually uh, want to buy and how that would impact the price. And uh, that, you know, having that approach, um, it made, made quite a big difference early on. Yeah. So once I was able to you know, prove myself, not just from an analytical point of view, you know, started with um, just helping out uh, more senior traders in the company. But I was, you know, allowed to trade small proprietary risk myself and start to make a, a bit of money and prove myself a bit more, uh, how do you call it, consistent, ultimately. Uh, and I was um, given quite early on the crude desk. Um, you know, we didn't have, nothing was too established at that point. Crude desk was doing minimal at the time, but uh, there was a lot of growth potential. And uh, it, it was the kind of method, the kind of approach from the company just to give people small risk and, um, you know, to experiment, to, to try bits and pieces at a time and, and try and build it up. And, and essentially, that's exactly what I did. I just uh, tried to look at every avenue within crude and um, started with, you know, low risk, simple strategies and, and learn by doing. You know, it was really con- constant experimentation, constant experimentation. But another key thing was um, market making, which was was keeping me kind of in the gate, keeping the money kind of rolling in. Um, and that goes back to what I was saying before about this idea of arbitrage between the uh, futures market and the um, OTC market, uh, which is harder for you know a retail trader to get involved in. It's the access to the to the OTC market, which I guess we'll talk about uh, in a bit. But uh, that was um, a way to kind of stay in the game while also you know, trying my directional strategies. I think the big jump came for me when um, I started to learn more and more about the underlying physical market that was ultimately driving the, you know, what, what I was doing, driving the futures prices and the OTC prices. But 
when I started to trade data Brent, so that's the uh, that's the swaps, the the OTC market, which uh, reflects the underlying price of Brent futures. So what, what everyone sees in the news that the underlying uh, physical prices for that is uh, displayed and assessed by um, this data Brent contract. So once I start to learn a lot more about that and and started to trade that contract and market make that contract. That's where things started to really, you know, take take a, a forward step, and um, you know, since then, built you know a really strong market making presence in that market, and uh, it's the basis for a lot of what I'm doing now, and a lot of the information I'll I'll uh, use to directionally trade. Okay, okay. So while you've been speaking, I've I've made a few notes here about some of the topics you've hit on, like supply side. Um, arbitrage between the futures and OTC, fundamentals, etc. Um, I'd really like to pick up on all those things. Just before we get too far into this, though, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about your actual development uh, as a trader on the trading side, because before joining Mandara, you hadn't really been in a trading position yourself. So how were you able to actually excel as a trader? Like, were there any, was there anything in particular which led to your greatest improvements and sort of leaps ahead? Yeah, so I think the most important thing for me was um, for improving, going back to this idea of experimentation because everything was so novel to what we were doing um, and ultimately had a small amount of risk. And yeah, a lot. You know, I was inexperienced, as, as inexperienced as you can get. So you really needed to trial and error with as, as limited amount of losing as limited amount of money as possible. So I'd say, um, you know, with with James King, uh, he was a prominent member in the firm, and, and you've spoken to him on on your podcast. He was there, and he. So the kind of two things can be answered in one. My greatest uh, improvements and how James helped me. James King helped me uh, quite a bit um, personally because uh, he introduced this approach of uh, of Cata goal setting. Um, so specifically, it was a change in mentality um, that was most important for me, I believe. But um, you know, instead of just hard work at the immediate problem at hand, it was actually you know what am I trying to do here? What does success really look like if I break it down? And what is stopping me getting there or what specifically are the obstacles in the way? So it wasn't just the trading, but also building the desk, building who I was as a person even. But um, I hugely bought into the concept of, you know, having these goals, trading or whatever and development and, um, you know, relentlessly pursued every avenue I could. So one particular part of that process is the what they call the PDCA cycle. So plan, do, check, act, whereby I would take you know, every obstacle that would stop me being, you know, making millions and millions a year, you know, having a, a huge desk, et cetera, et cetera. That's where I wanted to get to. And the obstacles getting in the way, you know, I'll break those down and they'd have to be very objective. You know, you can't just say, you can't just summarize, oh, it's just really difficult um, because the market's tricky, et cetera. You need to say, you know, something very specific like, um, you know, covering multiple strategies at one time is difficult for one person. Uh, or small trading small size in the market in the OTC market is perceived negatively by market participants and you know you would then look at that obstacle and then hypothesize about how you could overcome that obstacle so using that example you know about covering multiple strategies you know an obvious one would be oh let's get someone in and let's let's get someone to help me out and will will that um will that translate into overcoming that obstacle and me me managing to cover multiple strategies at one time or you know, another one might be traders don't like to trade who they don't know. So I would say, okay, fine. So the first experiment I'm going to do is, uh, well, my hypothesis is if I meet these guys and I and they know who I am and they get to know me and they realize I'm not a bad guy, um, it should help my trading. So I could start to conduct experiments like go out for drinks, go out and do some kind of social event. And then I would then, you know, as I was running these experiments week in, week out, I would just review them and see how it was going. And then you get to the next step. Like, yeah, I did actually notice it was a little easier to trade and people were more willing to, uh, to accept this small counterpart um, in the market. And then I could then get to the next stage and slowly start to um, become more of a, you know, increase my size, things like that to be more appealing to the, to the rest of the market. And, um, and it would just go by that process again and again and again. And it led to, you know, huge breakthroughs. And we're talking from everything from my trading to building the desk. 
Um, and by the end of my time there, you know, I was hugely scaled the desk to, you know, about seven times the profits it was making um, originally. Uh, well, no, more than that. But, you know, from my year one to year three, it was just like a seven times increase and expanded to have, you know, a team of three on the crew desk. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty serious, self-sufficient uh, business uh, towards towards the end. And um, but as I say, it, it was as much a mentality shift for me personally, as well as the define process. Um, and it's evolved to me just having more in general a stoic approach, kind of stoic approach to how I tackle things and, uh, you know, objectively analyzing what the issues are and what our weaknesses are to really, you know, overcome it without emotion. And I just couldn't recommend that way of thinking enough. But I guess just that was the core of everything I was doing as I was trying to improve because there wasn't that person there to say to me, oh, well, this is how you do it. Because you know, we hadn't done it before as a company. We hadn't been in the crude market. We hadn't trade, traded directionally, really. So uh, it was like really up to me. But as I say, James King's um, approach to, well, assisting us with things like Kata goal setting was just, you know, r- really, really useful. And also set the grounding for, you know, a lot of the thinking when building up Onyx Commodities, which is see where I am now. And, um, You know, we train this way of thinking and so much of it is taking responsibility for guiding your own path. And the idea, you know, any problem and any obstacle can be overcome as long as you break it down and and you experiment, hypothesize, and you keep going relentlessly. And uh, yeah, I would say that was the the key thing. Um, That CATA goal setting, how how do you spell that just in case someone actually wants to look it up and find out a bit more about it online? Yeah, sure. So I think um, it's... Toyota Kata, so the company Toyota used this approach. Uh, so uh, K-A-T-A is the uh, is the actual Kata part of it. Um, there's books on it. Yeah, there's, there's plenty on the internet for that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm actually uh, glad you brought that up because I'm pretty sure when I spoke to James afterwards, we, when we'd wrapped up the podcast and we were just talking afterwards, he said that was something he actually forgot to mention and, and wish he had. So um, you've covered it. So that's good. So I was just, just reiterating because, you know, what's so good about that is James isn't, wasn't a trader. He, he didn't know anything about, you know, sp- the specifics of oil trading or oil or anything. But, you know, it did, that wasn't necessary. It was, it was the mentality shift. And that's what, was, that's what I think was so impressive about it. You know, none of us knew the answer, but... It's, it's instead of saying, oh, one day we could and, oh, you know, let's wait until we get lucky. It was break it all down and let's see. And, and you know, I, I owe him a lot for that. And um, hopefully, you know, we'll continue to work together <laughs> because it's great. Yeah. And if anyone wants to hear that episode with James, it's episode 133. So if you go chatwithtraders.com slash 133, uh, you'll find it. You'll be able to listen to it there. Uh, Greg. When you were talking there, you touched on it just a couple times. You said that the mentality shift was a big thing for you. What about the mentality side of it uh, was kind of blocking you from moving ahead uh, previously? Like, what was your mentality like sort of when you've day one at Mandara compared to sort of how you've come out the other side? I mean, completely different person. It was... I think maturity is is probably one of the main things. You know, I was a very young guy when I started, um, and you just don't really understand how things work in the, in the real world. You know, as cliche it sounds, but it, it's true. And uh, I think there's a few things that the mentality of you know extreme ownership and 100 percent responsibility. You know, anything, ev- anything, and everything you do is impacted by how you do it and um, your approach to it. So you can influence anything you want. There's no point saying, ah, oh, well, this happened, the market was poor and oh, it's really difficult. It's it's on you, you know, to, to ultimately uh, generate results and that's it. And that is what I love about trading as well. It's so binary. It's you make money or you don't. So everything else in between is is kind of noise. Um, so that, that was one thing. Um, I think another big thing was, just getting on with it in a, in a, in a sense that, uh, you know, if something bad happened or I got told off, you know, there's plenty of that going on. And, uh, 
I would argue back a lot, and I would, um, and, I, and I think that's just a combination of immaturity and ego, really. And, and as soon as I learned to put that to one side, that you know, really does not. That I am not special, you know. I guess it, that takes quite a long time for guys coming out of uni to realize, guys and girls coming out of uni to realize, because you know, you think oh, I've done well, and I, I, I think a lot about myself, and I'm looking forward to this great job I've just got. But then you realize, you know, you're at the bottom of the pile, and you're in this heavily, heavily competitive industry that everyone wants to make money in and everyone's, you know, in a way out to get each other. So, you know, that you can't think you're special and you've really got to have a scientific approach to everything. And, and a, um, you can't get too emotional about things. You, you can't uh, get, get defensive about things. They just are what they are. And how are you going to, uh, to tackle those problems? And again, you know, back to this Cather idea, it's, it's, it's all about breaking it down. And, but yeah, the mentality shift in general, um, I would I would pretty much put it down to just taking true responsibility and uh, you know in trading in particular I don't think you'll ever meet a good trader who doesn't have that ability to say you know it's all on me and everything I can account for anything even you know people say oh there's a black swan event or oh I could never have expected that to happen well okay yes not specifically but you should always be aware of these kind of terrorist things and you should always be aware of the possibility of things happening and have some kind of plan for it. You know, if I'm entering a trading period now, if I'm entering into a trade in particular, of course, I'm planning what I expect to happen, how I'm going to make the most amount of money out of it. But I've also got to think, okay, so what if that doesn't happen? And what if actually the reverse happens? How am I going to protect myself and how am I not going to lose or lose less and, and, and protect uh, the, the P&L base? And uh, that's a very difficult thing to get your head around because it's essentially saying, you know, there is no wrong or right, um, which, you know, is a huge thing for me. Um, there is no one in trading can can call themselves wrong or right because you, you ultimately never really know why there was a flurry of price action in a given direction. There's there's so many different types of participants. There's so many different types of um, traders, and, and all you can really do is hypothesize about what's going to happen and give yourself the best chance of success by having a clear plan, entering efficiently and using sound risk management principles. So, you know, like Ray Dalio in his, his latest book was talking about it as well. You know, that he who lives by the crystal ball soon learns to eat ground glass. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good quote because, you know, you can't go into trade and think you're some kind of guru. You know, what you really are is a risk manager. And um, it's about learning how to structure proper trade off that's what makes you a professional trader and uh that again that mentality shift of i'm not special i'm just i've got to learn how to do this as best i can with the skills i have and really identify my strengths but also identify my weaknesses and and constantly uh hypothesize, hypothesize about how to overcome those weaknesses yeah i really like how you've spoken about taking extreme responsibility for pretty much everything which, which happens in, in your trading because, I mean, you, you meet people in just everyday life, right? And you just, you know from speaking with them that, you know, they're, they're always blaming someone else for, you know, what's caused this or that. But as a trader, I mean, you just can't succeed with a mentality like that, correct? I mean, absolutely. And, and, and it's, I guess, surprising but not surprising. We see it all the time. You know, guys coming in fresh from university especially, they have to just realign their thinking to that. And, uh, well, I know because I had to do it as well, but you know, you almost never look back once you do have that approach. You can't see how you ever thought like it was, it was anything but your fault. Yeah. In a way it's something that sh needs to be taught, but it's a shame it doesn't need to be taught because I wish I'd basically realized that a lot, a lot earlier. I guess it didn't really, I still ended up in a good job, but it's just, you know, my approach to even university work would have changed because there's always something you can blame. And, um, it's just the idea of just get down to it, have a methodical approach and get going and that there's no excuses. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just the only way to think, really. This episode of Chat With Traders is supported by Robin Hood, an investing app. But there's something special about Robin Hood. They let you buy and sell stocks and options for free. Robin Hood does not charge any commissions. Their goal is to make the barrier to entry as low as possible for new investors to get started. So that's why Robinhood have no account minimum deposits and have taken great care designing their app in a way that's really intuitive for newcomers and anyone really. View charts, market data, manage orders, personalized news feeds, all with just a few taps on your smartphone. 
And now, Robinhood is giving listeners of Chat With Traders a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up at traders.robinhood.com. Again, you can sign up at traders.robinhood.com. And there's one other sponsor, the Venetian Las Vegas. It's located in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip, featuring all suite accommodations. Soaring lobbies and atriums open to exclusive resort amenities, including Canyon Ranch Spa, over 160 retail shops within the Grand Canal shops, showcasing Barney's New York, Louis Vuitton, Tory Birch, and more. Celebrated chefs Wolfgang Puck, Thomas Keller, Emeril Legassi, Lorena Garcia, and Buddy Cake Boss Velastro create an eclectic mix of cuisine in their restaurants, from American, French, Italian, and Asian to Southern and Latin fusion. Plus, the Venetian offers the best in entertainment with Baz, Human Nature Jukebox, and Classic Rock Residencies. The resort features a five-acre pool and garden deck, four theatres and two casinos. And the Venetian is host to the most exciting worldwide gaming on the Strip. For more information, visit venetian.com. The Venetian Las Vegas, where you can come as you are. Uh, so, Greg, we, we caught up uh, a week or so ago and just had a quick chat. One of the things we spoke about, or, you know, you were speaking to me about, is uh, kind of your core trading principles, or you, you, you mentioned it, and you described it as trade craft. Um, I'd love to go into that a little more because I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, what do you mean when you talk about trade craft? Yeah, so trade craft through a combination of you know your, your trading principles themselves uh, and the risk management principles and the actual structure to your trade. So, kind of key steps. So, first things first. You know, I, I prefer more of the fundamentals analysis. I know there's a lot of people who trade technically, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whatever your core reason for it is that works is fine. But for me, um, you know. I need to formulate an idea of what's going to happen first in the market based on sound reasoning. So most people will call this taking a view, but I don't really like that because it's, it's, it's the idea that, you know, it's a story, et cetera. I prefer to say you need to form, you know, a hypothesis. Um, so a view might be, you know, I'm really bullish, um, bunker fuel, uh, as a conclusion of, you know, there's low stocks, there's, the refinery margins aren't running, so they're not going to produce as much of this stuff. And there's r- rising bunker demand from shipping. You know, that'll be a view. But the next step, you know, when it becomes a hypothesis, is marrying that view with uh, how you actually think the market will react, given your understanding of the market dynamics. So it's not just, you know, oil will go up and down. It's, well, okay, I think this, but also I know that, you know, the market might be too long or too short. There might be a big player that, um, needs to either stop out of their position or defend it. Um, you need to know what kind of market condition are we in? Is it volatile? Is it trending? Is it driven by macroeconomics at the moment or is it driven more by physical pricing? And once you've collated all this information, you can make the best educated guess possible for you on the market's next move. So it's you know a very key consideration of mine. And uh, it's, again, something we train at Onyx. And, uh, yeah, I think, um, probably the next step is you want to stay out of that herd mentality side of trading. So what I mean by that, you know, once you become part of the herd, do do, do you know what I mean by that? So buying into what they're saying on TV or something like that. Exactly. Well, just as a loose definite, you know, if there's 10 people trading and nine out of the 10 people are doing the same thing, you know, there's that, that would be part of the herd. It's part of the majority. And, and once you become part of the majority and trade in the same way or the same direction, even, you know, you can quite quickly become in very dangerous position for a number of reasons. Like firstly, you know, if you're thinking like the herd, you're thinking like the majority, then you're on the back foot. So if the market goes against you and you need to get out, you need to stop out, all these traders will be stumbling over themselves to do the same thing. And so the reversals will be that much more aggressive and painful. Well, um, we saw that just recently uh, in the S&P 500, didn't we? 
we well, exactly um i've got a better example <laughs> than that actually i've heard um the uh the bitcoin situation <laughs> so you know I, I do believe in the blockchain methodology it sounds sounds and looks and 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 reads very well as a concept but if you map the trading on bitcoin it's fascinating and there's an actual graph i've got uh kind of permanently on my computer that just you know exactly mirrors what's going on with bitcoin at the moment and i just think it's so interesting and um uh you can kind of map out her, how this herd reacts and you know you have the initial uh smart money who believe in the concept and they invest in it and you know they're early into it then you get enthusiasm for that idea you get more press and you get you know all these people buying into it then it gets higher and higher you get greed uh and you know eventually you have this there's no more buyers and there's literally no one left to to buy and um and then you're going to fall down but then the worst bit is as it comes down you know you're susceptible to all these biases you know oh it's uh it's just getting lower because um it's a slight blip you know that you could name any type of reason um but, you know that would be an anchor bias that'd be you're anchoring yourself to a price and you believe it's going to get higher but why you don't know what the true value is you don't know why it would be that high um and you can also see in the in the in the price action that the panic and of course the herd when it panics you know literally like a herd of animals in uh in uh africa you know that kind of panic and aggression and it's it can be hugely damaging to your position um the market also tends to look more irrational when the herd is involved in one particular direction and i put that down to you know there's no one left really to make sense of the current market you know you can't sell anymore so to sell when oversupplied is is a is a good thing so oil you know that's that makes sense but if every single major market participant is already short then who is left to sell it um that kind of concept so you know you might not even be bullish but you know some typical trades that you'll uh, you'll notice will work you know if everyone's one direction you can literally take the other side and just by the laws of market dynamics you know when these guys need to reverse their position then of course it's going to go the other way so it, but as i say that that herd idea is just um it's just very dangerous and you know it's the tulip mania type thing that and we're seeing it in bitcoin as well as i was saying <laughs> Uh, and what about risk management? Do you have any core principles around managing risk? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was just going to say just, just the, the kind of final kind of point on the oh, trading sure. principle. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Just this idea of, um, I just call it trading what you're trading. It sounds, sounds a bit of a silly way of putting it, but you know, a lot of people think, like again, like Bitcoin or, or, or Brent or whatever it is, you think you're okay, I'm buying oil. I'm buying no, you're not buying oil, you're buying Brent oil, you're buying North Sea oil. And of course, North Sea has its own pricing mechanisms as it has its own underlying value. So yeah, for Brent in, in particular, it's it's five oil fields in the North Sea. It's not even the entire North Sea. And ultimately those prices of those grades of oil will ultimately set the price for the futures, which is hugely participated in contract that maybe you know, quite a few people don't actually understand how it prices. So, you know, a, a good example of this the situation in December, um, we had a, um, a hairline fracture on a pipeline. Um, and it was uh, pipeline in crude from one of these oil fields that prices Brent. And, you know, it was a big deal and it, it did stop uh, crude flowing. But, you know, in the global sense of things, it wasn't a big deal but because it was so centered on the North Sea cause absolute havoc. And if you hadn't known about that, you know, you really would be on the back foot. And again, you'd be trading like the herd. You'd think, well, there's so much buying. It's so much ira like huge, irrational, high volume buying. I need to buy or, or, you know, at the very least, I'm going to get stopped out here and you don't even know why. Um, so that idea of really getting to grips with what it is you're actually trading. Uh, and it's the same for gasoline. It's the same for or anything that you trade. What is the actual true value concept underlying? And what do I have to pay attention to? Not, not just the generic analysis um yeah but uh but the risk management side of things so i think first things first is is, is the stop evaluation you know um so you have to determine the value expected that you, that you think it's going to get to but then you also need to determine where the value will get to or the price of the contract will get to where you know you've misjudged it so if you think it's going to go from 60 to 65 on brent 
but you know, you put yourself and you envisage, okay, but if it does get to 57 or lower, how would you feel in that situation? How are you looking at the market? And is that, is that, is that not a price which is telling you, you know, all the factors you consider are clearly wrong because the, the, then the price wouldn't be this, this, uh, this low. So you have to kind of set that level for yourself. And that might be a consideration of volatility, um, you know, market events and obviously the timing, the length of the trade. So you have to factor that all that in to, you know, the evaluation of, of your stop. And I think it's sounds, it sounds relatively simple, but I just think that people don't do that thinking before they don't actually. And again, it comes back to the original thing I was saying about believing, you know, you're not actually special. You're not this guru. You need to think oh, there's a very good chance I'm going to be wrong here. So when do I think I wrong? What price do I think I'm wrong? Um, but it's also not making that mistake of, of putting your stop to a place where, you know, for instance, you think that oil is going to go from 60 to 65. That's a big move uh, relative percentage wise. It's not going to happen in a day. And if it did, it would be, you know, event you could ne you never would have seen coming. Um, so given your analysis and given your hypothesis and why you think that's going to go up to 65, you've got to give it uh, enough time. And um, so if you were there for to, to put that trade on for a week and be like, why is it not 65? Obviously that's silly, but also, you know, if you were not to, if you were to put your stop at 59, it's only a dollar and you're expecting five, you know, a dollar, if you look at the Brent volatility, that's not a big deal. And that could just be someone, you know, someone doing a huge hedge and moving it and it's very temporary. Um, and you would have been stopped out when there was no need to be stopped out. You need to, you needed to have factored that in to your analysis. And again, you know, it comes back to, if you know when you're wrong or you've got a good idea of when you are um, not seeing what you had expected, then that's the number you need to have in mind uh, based on all these considerations. Um, and then you go and start saying, right, so how much, given this is what I, the level where I think I'm going to be wrong, if that's $3, then, you know, I need to only risk, I need to know that I'm risking $3. Therefore, I'm only going to risk the amount of money that correlates to that, to that $3 and I shouldn't be risking anymore. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So if you've only got, you know, three grand to risk and you, you know, first of all, you need a $3 stop. So you should only be doing a, uh, one, one lot, which is because everything is a thousand, uh, thousand barrels in, in Brent. So yeah, I hope, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So the next thing would be of your total cal capital available. If someone gives you X amount, you know, there might be a, an element of, you know, I'm only actually going to risk ultimately 10% of that capital. And of that 10%, you know, I'm only going to risk 10% of that per trade or even less. Um, and you need to establish that and be really quite strict on that because, you know, you, you need to keep yourself in the game for as long as possible. And, and you can't expect uh, a ridiculously high win, low, win loss ratio. You've got to expect that you are going to be wrong a lot of times or you are going to lose money a lot of times. So this needs to be, to be factored in. Uh, there are too many people, they just risk too much up front. And, um, you know, you could actually be, have some great ideas and great approach to the market, but because your trade craft and your risk management is poor, you know, you've, you've been, uh, taken out of the game and, uh, a lot of careers are ruined over that. Um, yeah. So, you know, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, big, big time trader, um, veteran in the market. Um, he would say, you know, I spent all day making his risk kind of vanilla and exactly what he wants, you know, not, sporadic risk and this and this and this is like, I have this view, this hypothesis, and this is how I'm going to express it. And that's all I want in my book. And, um, he spends his day, he says, making himself feel good in the sense that, you know, you're going to feel good if you've got the right risk on, you know, you're comfortable with it. You've set your parameters, you know, anything outside of that and you get an edgy feeling and you're unnerved. That's probably a big sign that you're doing something wrong. Um, you know, another huge one, huge, huge one, not adding to your losing position. You know, you're, 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 you buy Bitcoin and it's coming down and everyone's panicking. You say, oh, I'll buy more, I'll buy more because I think it's going to go up. And you're averaging into a losing position and, and it's, it's can be so cataclysmic and uh, not just, you know, for money, but bias in your head and your, it's, it's a terrible cycle to get into. So just do not average into a losing position. Another guy is uh, a top trader, Dennis Gartman. He has a, a list of rules. And yeah, one of them is buy what is strong, sell what is weak. And uh, I love that quote because to really capture moves, you have to not fall to biases such as anchor bias, you know, a perceived perception of the price being too high or too low and not realizing that highs and lows are always being set. New highs, new lows are always being set. 
and the market is constantly in this state of overbought, oversold. So to just say oh, it's too high, you know, relative to what there's, there's no history is not necessarily representative of what's going to happen in the future. And you need to, you know, run that winner or, or um, stop out aggressively uh, or not be fooled just by a low price and think, oh, I'm just going to buy it because it's low because you, there's no real definition of what that means. And I think that's, that's a, that's a great risk management principle as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, man. Um, now your current situation. So you've moved on from, uh, Mandara. Um, how long were you there? Three years, almost okay. exactly. And now what's your situation now? I know, um, you, you've started, uh, Onyx Commodities. Can you just tell us a little bit about, um, what that sort of operation is? So yeah, operations at Onyx, we're a similar type of, uh, function in the sense that we're an oil derivative uh, company. We're trading the oil derivatives, you know, uh, crude, um, but also gasoline, distillates, etc., cetera, um, which all make up the barrel of oil. And the core of what we do, you know, we're a relatively s- small shop in the sense of, um, you know, the amount of capital we have. Um, but, you know, we're a major market participant and that's, that's sourced from our market making. So, you know, end users, producers coming in wanting prices um, to hedge and to uh, to lock in their finances. You know, we're there to take that and we're there to provide the liquidity for the market. And by doing so, you know, we're able to, you know, alongside analysis, really, really determine the flows and what's going on. And it's a great edge. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, you know, market make, make some money out of that, but also directionally trade and proprietary trade and add as many different types of strategies as we can, uh, all from a derivative angle, um, you know, leading towards, kind of machine learning type thinking, algorithmic trading, you know, every, anything and everything to, to essentially make money um, from from these derivative contracts. So we're, we're consistently hiring uh, junior traders, a bit like myself and how I came through. We're also hiring slightly more experienced guys um, and, you know, building a tech team alongside to to assist, uh, to, to assist with that and make sure, you know, we're, we're really firing as efficiently as possible. And the idea, you know, is really to, sky's the limit type thing, you know, making money and we want to continue to make money. We want to keep scaling the business. We want to keep scaling up our proprietary trading and, um, using this concept of, uh, of market making as our core as, as the source of our edge. You know, we, we see things that I would say it's as a collective, you know, we're seeing a lot of things that I would sure, I'll be sure that most people aren't because not, not as many people are as active as we are, you know, of the cleared volumes on the exchanges, we're well up there. Um, and you know, that will, that will continue. Okay. So just so I, uh, I'm clear, you are trading obviously the futures contracts and you're also involved in the OTC markets as well. Yes, exactly. Okay. Excellent. So this side of it, the, the OTC futures, I know very little about. So I'd love to ask a few questions around that. So, I mean, just 101, the very basics, what are OTC futures markets. Oh, sorry. Well, the other if it's an OTC market, it's not a futures market, is it? Um. A- anyway, what's <laughs> just what are actually, what are the OTC def- markets? The words. Yeah, sure. So, well, that's the way I've defined it. You know, essentially, the all futures markets you have the screen based trades. So the the Brent, the WTI, the the Arbob futures, you know, the things that, you know, retail investors and a lot of people can access. And it's the price is there and liquidity is there and it's very tight bid offer. So that's the futures. But the futures you then have, they are then priced by the uh, pricing methodology, whatever that might be. So for for instance, again, going back to Brent, that's um, the value of the uh, OTC future market in dated Brent and the uh, the actual North Sea physical. So they combine the prices and have a methodology for determining the actual uh, end price. And that will then filter through to the price of the futures ultimately. Um, so the key difference I would say immediately is these, uh, they're actually swaps. We call them swaps, but they got redefined as futures, um, you know, a while back. But essentially, the idea is they they price out um, their contracts, which price out daily, and they, they can, you can basically specify whatever uh, pricing mechanism you want. You could have it expanding over a day, a week, a month, and the idea being that these contracts are going to more accurately reflect the price of the physical. So there's so many different types of swaps. Um, 
you know, you, you've got Arbob gasoline, which is the big gasoline contract you see in the futures market. But then you've got you know, the European gasoline, the Mediterranean gasoline, uh, Los Angeles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all got their own their own contracts, and they more they they reflect the price of the actual location to which they where they're defined. So, for instance, you know, Mediterranean gasoline that's specific to an area in the Mediterranean. The price of the contract, the price of the physical in that area, will price the um, the value of the Mediterranean gasoline derivative contract. So the whole the whole point of it is end users, producers can more accurately hedge because if they want to hedge their um, so for producers wanting to to hedge, it's it's not as simple as you know selling selling just the futures contracts. They they want to have something that more accurately reflects the underlying physical. So. For instance, the, the West Africans, they, they're not, when they are producing oil, they're the Nigerians and they, and they want to um, lock in the price that they're selling at. If they sell futures, they're going to get the bulk of the hedge off. You know, generally speaking, the 60% of the world's crude is priced against this future price. But if they hedge with dated rent, so the actual swap, the, the underlying North Sea swap, that more accurately tracks the underlying physical price relative to the future. So, you know, it could have dollar, dollar fifty variations to the Brent futures price. So, of course, you know, dollar on, uh, you know, a million barrels is obviously a lot of money. And these guys produce millions and millions a day. So they need that more accurate hedge. And, and that's the whole point of, of swaps. It's, it's, it's the idea of more, more accurate hedges. Um, so that's there. Um, but in order for people to order for these guys to also get a good price, it's an OTC market, meaning that you have to buy off someone not it's not a screen it's not an algorithm it's it's you know I'm neg you negotiate a price between using a broker or using a screen um saying i'm going to bid you this price and this person's going to offer that price and the value is determined by where it trades not by just numbers immediately there are available on the screen so that's why market makers are so important because you know we're providing prices that um are quite close to perceived value that you know might you could just not have that price in theory you know there's no one to sell so how do you how do you buy how do you how do you hedge it as an end user you're going to need someone to give you a price um so, so that's where that's where we would come in okay now just so that i actually understand uh, understand the the landscape and the the various products you're talking about here so you've you, you've essentially got three different uh three different things so you've got the futures markets which uh, you know, pretty much everyone listening to this podcast, I'm sure, is familiar with, uh, you know, products which trade on, you know, the Chicago exchanges or London exchanges, right? Mm -hmm. You've then got the physical, which is the actual barrels of oil that the producers uh, produce. And then you've got the swaps and or as you could also call them OTC market. Mm hmm. Is, is that correct? Those That's the that's, three? That's correct. Yes, exactly. Okay. You spoke about Brent being a combination of a couple uh, of oil from a couple various places. And the futures price represents these uh, oil from these two various uh, areas. How does that work? Because we're... Obviously, people who are trading the futures market, a lot of them are trading, you know, not even looking at the price of or the value of oil in these other areas. They're purely just trading the, the listed futures markets. Um, so, is this what creates, you know, arbitrage or probably spread opportunities when uh, these prices get out of whack? So short answer, yes, um, but I think the most, the best way to, to put it is is they these physical prices do ultimately set the price for the future, but the future prices once a month. So, you know, April future will price at the end of February. So February um, 28th, we'll have an, the expiry of the April Brent futures contract. And on that day, the price is assessed using the physical, uh, using an index to uh, determine the final value of the Brent future. So there's a, a week before this expiry date, there's the limit day where you know the exchange limits the amount of uh, volume any one person can hold into the, the final expiry price. 
And most traders, you know, most um, guys who essentially don't really care about the physical, um, they're just maybe putting it more on a spec basis, they would have rolled it to the next month. So they avoid that fluctuation um, into expiry because they just roll it to the next month and they keep doing that. Um, and that's that's a way to avoid this uh, kind of collapse into the into the final physical price of the North Sea. Okay. I'm not sure I fully understand that. So can you just explain again what what is the Brent contract? Like what's it made up of? So the Brent future is it's just a financially settled contract. So buying and selling with anyone who's got access to it. Uh, and if you were to to buy it and wait until that contract expired, it would just expire out and you would have to settle the difference financially. Yeah, but um, earlier earlier on you gave an example sure. where you said that um, Brent is essentially the combined price of sure. X and X. What, what were sure. those couple so, things? So on the expiry day, um, there's a Brent – futures index, uh, which is the methodology used to, to assess that final price. And what they'll do is they'll take the physical prices that are traded during the day and they'll, they'll take the average of those um, prices um, and those will be the, the five oil fields I, I discussed. And um, they will then yeah, use that average to, to determine the, the final price. So what's the attraction to someone like yourself, you know, as a trader or a market maker or what's the benefit for someone like you to trade OTC markets? Like what's the attraction there? Well, as I, I mentioned before, um, because it's more closely linked to the physical, uh, we get by trading in and out, obviously there is the ability to actually make money from um, trading disparities in the forward curve. So we would be, if someone wants to hedge in six months, we can, uh, we can trade that contract with them and then trade that versus the, you know, a month one contract and then have a time spread in between and manage that exposure and try and make money like that. You know, we're using the, um, the spreads and the outrights to, to, to essentially try and close the position but make money while doing it. Um, so there's obviously that attraction by actually just making money but also – Probably more importantly, because the physicals has such a big say on the ultimate futures um, prices, it, it's the information. You know, it's it's not as simple as, uh, oh, well, OPEC have cut and um, the price is going to go up. It's, well, we actually need to see how the actual physical is reacting. And if we've seen a number of end users coming in and, and looking to buy and we're seeing the physical differentials rally and we're seeing positive refinery profits so they're going to be running more crude all these factors we can actually see evidence of in the otc market because they're going to go out and forward hedge that if, if they think there's get off there is a lack of crude they're going to go out and hedge it they're going to go out and buy future contracts to ensure they don't miss out on a cheaper price because they know the price is going to go in the rally so you know bigger companies have bigger influences on the market because they might be ultimately the bigger buyers of physical or sellers so paying attention to what these guys are doing and, and how they're operating um, is, uh, is, is, is the edge. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's what gives the information and that's what we weigh up to then ultimately have a discretionary view for ourselves and, and make money through proprietary trading. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Let, let's speak about how you actually uh, are transacting. So you said before, you know, there's not really an exchange for this sort of thing because obviously it's an OTC market. How, if you want to take, if you want to, you know, buy or sell some swaps, how do you actually go about that? First of all, we have access to to trade these contracts by having access to the exchange, so the ISO or CME exchange. Uh, so the exchanges guarantee both sides. So if I was to go in and buy a contract off um, off someone else, the way I would do that is. Uh, essentially got a broker box and um, I will go down to these brokers and I'll say, look, I want to buy this or, or they'll tell me look, I want to sell this. Um, where could you bid it? And I would say this price and then we would negotiate that. He would then go talk to uh, the, the trader who wanted that price and we would then start negotiating and then uh, we'd agree on a price, agree on a volume and, um, and that's the trade. You know, it's up to the trader. It's up to us to then risk manage that to then, 
you know, keep track of what we've done and, and our exposure, et cetera, you know, from reports from the exchange, et cetera. So a, a typical trade on a lit exchange is going to happen in like literally fractions of a second. What's the timeline of an OTC transaction? Obviously not as quick, quite as quick, but it can be very quick as well. You know, say someone says, I'm a seller at this price, you like, buy it. And deal's done. You confirm the trade over a recorded line and that, that deal is, is done. And then it will get posted to the exchange and you'll see it into your account and, uh, and you're done. So when you say it gets posted to the exchange, w- which exchange is this? So like ICE and, and CME, so Intercontinental Exchange and Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Okay, but it's not it's it's on a swaps market though, isn't it? It's not a like the regular crude oil futures or something like that. It's not in terms of how it prices, but it is in terms of how how it clears how so the same way you would buy a future, you know, even as a retail investor, that would be booked under whatever platform you're using. You would know you now own, you know, five KB of a Brent future, for instance. It's very similar like that. You know, you will buy, you'll post it to the exchange, and the exchange will then say you you ha- you have five KB of Brent futures or five KB of um, dated Brent swap, and uh, that's the the whole point of using the exchange is if you then uh, default as a company and you can't honour the financial difference from where you bought it and where where you sold it, um, they guarantee it, and that's what allows you know, access and, and it used to be that a lot of these trades used to be bilateral. So the, that's why the banks were so much bigger. The banks uh, had, um, would give financing and, and would trade directly with, with uh, counterparts and they would finance the deal. So you would you know, no one would ever see what deal has been taking place because uh, they would agree, you know, we're going to, I'm going to buy this off you and we're going to agree that the settlement price is whatever, you know, Platts, the pricing agency determines it to be. And we'll keep that relationship of um, who owes what between ourselves. But this is transition now onto the exchanges. And um, and that's what I was saying before about them guaranteeing every side so you can you can more frequently trade and there's more transparency because that these trades they're um, they're reported and people see the price and the and the uh, the volume done these days. Okay. So what you're saying is that the volume done in, in OTC or swaps markets ultimately shows up on exchanges like CME or Vo- um, ICE. Essentially, yes, but this is the this is the tricky part when you're calling it OTC because it's really the official. If you say an OTC, it's usually between directly between one person and other. I'm talking about the over the counter market that I trade. You know, I'm ultimately always posting these to the exchange, and, and the trades we do are visible to everyone. So it's. It's the over the counter of the market in the sense that I'm using, I'm trading with other people, but um, everyone will see that trade. And yeah, essentially. Okay. I think I'm, I think I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> cool. Um, what are the risks inherent um, to you as a trader of these markets? Like, is there anything which uh, is perhaps unique as opposed to other markets? Yeah. I mean, the, the, well, firstly, trading, um, if you're trading with someone and not, not a screen, you might have said to the broker, okay, I'll buy what you just said you'd sell, but they, because I can't get a hold of them. I can't confirm this deal. So you've got that kind of counterpart risk. Um, and you might have some serious exposure that you needed to cover with that price. And if, it's, if you miss it, you know, you're kind of screwed. So um, there's that risk. And there's also these prices, they, as I say, because it's people to people, for it to go from one price to the next, there's no real definition of how that increment needs to work. It doesn't need to go up cent by cent. It could go from you know, $4.50 to $4.75 in one trade, in theory, because it's traded with people, not, not the screen. Um, so that's why it's such a big deal to, to understand who the traders are, understand how they operate, and understand the people you're trading and the market you're trading, because you need to know that when situations like that could arise like for instance in this pipeline example i gave you you know you couldn't find sellers because everyone was trying to buy so if you don't find a seller then the, then the price can just immediately gap up to whatever the next trade price is and there was nothing in between so you know you could have lost 30 40 cents on that without even anything in between so 
that's that's what the you know key difficulty when you talk about trading with other people uh, you know like your counterpart to any given trade is that an actual trader or is that sometimes a a producer of the physical as well yeah it's a good question so so i would say these days um most of the time um it's it is traders so they also you know a trader at bp or shell and some of these big guys they are producers and consumers and and they've got you know all these different types of risk and there'll be a central it'll be centralized to their traders to manage um so they can be buyers and sellers all the time you'll never really know their um ultimate exposure but uh for people to actually trade in these these uh these markets you, you do you do need someone who kind of has that not just a okay i'm just going to sell because i need to sell or just need to buy because i need to buy they need to actually understand what's going on uh, so you would classify pretty much everyone involved as, as a trader wouldn't just be a producer doing something well you know if you know what i mean yeah okay and, and let's say bp for example are they doing proprietary trading to make p l or are they only trading to try and hedge a position and manage their uh, uh, inventory? Well, this is the thing. I mean, you can never really know. I mean, how do you define what speculation is? Uh, or, or um, yeah, if you, if you have a lot of inherent exposure from all the physical oil you're buying and selling, then when you choose to hedge it or when you choose what you choose to leave yourself long or leave yourself short, whatever it is, you know, there's always a form of speculation in that. You know, if you don't immediately hedge, um, you know, let's say the BP guys in, in Chicago want to trade to the US, um, they want to hedge some US production, and then the the refineries in, in Rotterdam and Europe wanna they want to buy some, they want to buy hedge, you, you, they've you know they've got to buy and a sell in the same company, right? So how they how they deal with it, or maybe that one of the guys won't buy, and um, therefore the net net impact of BP is they're short. You'll never know if that's a speculative view they're taking, or how, how do you really define that? Do you see what I mean? It, with the proprietary traders, you know, of course, we're just trading, we're just trying to make money out of what's what's there on on a blank sheet of paper. We're trying to make money out of of any way we can. But these guys have got such big physical exposure that it's a completely different game, um, and speculation means something different. Yeah. That's a that's a good point, actually. <laughs> um, so, you know, as we're talking about BP and not trying to pick on BP here, but like, what edge do you have as a smaller player? You know, in the scheme of things, uh, in an area which is dominated by these big companies like BP. Yes, it's, that is ultimately why it's so dangerous. I did. I, it was should have said that in answer to your previous question about what there's potential dangers. You know if these guys know something we don't, which chances are it's quite likely uh, and we've got the wrong position, you know, it can be very, very dangerous. But again, the edge comes from market making. So this idea of trading, intimately understanding the forward curve. So whereas a, whereas a bigger player, they'll just tend to be buyers and sellers of something in particular. We'll look at anything and everything. And because ultimately all these uh, contracts are linked so, you know, the way data Brent links to futures and the way gasoline links to futures, et cetera, et cetera, you know, there is a link and you can trade the time spreads in between them. Um, so if you're caught short, you know, it doesn't mean you, you just have to buy what you sold. You can buy something in the future. You can buy a different contract against it and hedge it that way. You know, you can get creative of what you do. So the edges, you know, we've got, you know, real expert understanding of that four curve and a, uh, you know, multiple strategies of, of dealing with risk that's taken on from, from market participants. And that's how you kind of avoid losses. But also, you know, you can also profit from those dislocations. But as I said before, you know, really, that's the beauty of it. You know, we're seeing what these guys are doing, which is very sought after information. But because we're the ones providing the plate, the, the price, then, of course, we get to see what, what, what the flow is. And, and that is ultimately very likely to impact the future price. And what about these markets, just generally speaking, you know, the years that you've been involved in oil, have you seen any big shifts or any big significant changes? So well, in the in the way it's traded? Or- Essentially, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, the market's, exactly. like, yeah, it's, it's constantly changing and evolving. And um, yeah, the latest shift I've seen in the last five years 
the banks, Lee, the investment banks having a lot less. They used to be the biggest market participants in oil. Um, and that's kind of power shift, if you like, has gone from them to the trade houses, um, BP Shells, the Glencores, the Vitals, the, these guys who, who trade a lot of physical oil and a lot of derivative contracts. Um, and they're big enough that they can finance big contracts and finance big risk, et cetera. Um, and the banks, you know, they, they, um, they're, they're pulling out. It's tighter regulation. Um, there's more transparency. And again, this, this idea I was telling you before about um, uh, trading on the exchange rather than directly with counterparts, you know, that's bad for banks because it, the more transparent it is, the, the less they can uh, profit from, you know, the number they've given someone they've traded directly with them versus where the actual price is. You know, it, it's, it tightens that up hugely because everyone knows what's going on and everyone has a clear defined area of where the price is. Um, so you, it just means you have to be, it's, it's, a, it's like anything, it's a path to efficiency. You know, we've become a lot more efficient. Um, and on that note, you know, a big one for the future is, is the blockchain thing because uh, there's Shell in particular, they recently invested in uh, Apply Blockchain, which is a, a startup company that um, is focusing on applying the blockchain methodology to physical oil trading. Uh, to, to account for it for, for it using that methodology and that would be huge you know the way that's traded and the way funds are allocated and the paperwork it will completely change things so it will become more auto automated and then it will change the profile of what you would need to be as a physical trader and that might in turn change the dynamics of the market trading itself and, you know yeah so that that point about things becoming more transparent and more efficient is, is of course you know it gives us guys like onyx uh, more of an edge because we can see what's going on um and I guess the, the bigger guys less because they don't own as many of the cards anymore as they used to because everything they were doing was kind of, they didn't have to broadcast. With this, with this shift of the investment banks becoming less involved, obviously that's created more transparency like you'd just spoken about. Has there been any shift or change in the way that price moves or anything on a more granular level? So... The introduction of algorithms and um, high frequency traders in the futures market, um, that's made a huge difference. So, so the liquidity, the volumes you see, um, they're just so much bigger than they ever were. Um, these guys are just trying to profit from from flows, essentially. Um, you know, big order comes in and they'll they'll essentially buy the offer, see the, you know, register those flows and, and buy, for instance, and try and profit from little increments like that. And the introduction of that all over the futures market is has made things a lot more efficient uh, on a price basis, and, a, and in turn a lot more volume. Um, otherwise, uh, biggest trading on a granny level, I would say. Uh, and another interesting point in the last few years, um, when I first started, a lot of people used to derive their you know views, hypotheses on the market from. Uh, macroeconomics, you know, so the dollar dollar ratio with oil and um, stocks, stocks, uh, stock prices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I did used to have it, and still it still does have an impact. But I would say, you know, when I first started, we would have to be all over the news, all over what was happening in FX rates to make sure we were aware of potential fluctuations. But it got to about, well, I know exactly when it got to. It got to second half or well, early 2014. And uh, I know it well because it was the first time I'd actually shorted the outright price of oil. And uh, ISIS invaded Iraq. That was the first day they did it as soon as I shorted it. And, uh, you know, it caused a huge fluctuation up, as you expect, you know, the risk of a war, the risk of um, uh, supply disruption. But very soon after that, because the underlying market was so weak, the actual physical market was so weak, we plummeted almost like from that from a few days after that event all the way down from 117 or so all the way down uh, to kind of 45. And since then, uh, or at least for that for for a couple of years, we were in this oversupplied market, and we it would just ignore macroeconomic events. It felt it just uh, you know people said there was correlations with the euro dollar as we came down. Okay, maybe, but it did seem to me that the market would would trade much more fundamentally. Um, and the considerations were a lot more on actual physical information. Um, you know, the OPEC, the, the US stocks and the, the whole shale um, production, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so little things would start to make a difference in the physical that never would have before. And in turn, the macro had less of an impact. However, in the last six months or so, kind of flipped back into a bullish market, you know, more undersupplied than oversupplied. And we're in this current state now. And actually, macroeconomics is starting to have another impact. So it's starting to have a big impact again. So we're again having to kind of go back to the drawing board and make sure we're aware of um, stock sell-offs and, and prices of, uh, uh, sorry, FX fluctuations and et cetera, et cetera. Like only, only last week, there was a huge speculative long position in, in, in Brent. And yes, the underlying market was starting to show signs of weakness, but the real collapse in oil seemed to be most timely with the equity sell-off we had last week. And um, it was massive. Uh, and to ignore macroeconomics these days would be would just be stupid. And I would say that that's, that's kind of always changing. Uh, but, it, but, it, but it's a key thing. So what type of resources do you rely on for good fundamental and macroeconomics uh information like so that you can stay on top of it what are some of the the resources which you lean on um kind of endless really constantly looking for any source of information uh kind of baseline for anyone can access you know just just typing in oil on google you'd be you know there's constantly consistent articles every 10 minutes or so uh and there's lots of people posting their analysis on there backed up by you know stock information and uh, real you know fundamental stats brought together um there's what OPEC ministers are talking about, what um, oil companies are discussing about their plans. There's all that kind of, you can constantly be on that cycle. That'd be kind of like upper layer of what I'm doing. And But then of course, as I said before, you know, my real edge is really seeing the evidence of that in in this um, physical linked market in the, in the swaps. And that's the, what's happening in that market is the kind of core of my understanding of what's really going on. And you've got to marry that with, um, what you think the overall health is. So that will be mainly, I'd say, refinery profits. So ultimately, refiners are the ones that buy crude. So the price of crude, you've got to know what the refineries are thinking or what they're, what they're doing to make the most amount of money. And if they're making a hell of a lot of profit from running a particular type of grade over another, then you need to be aware of that the price could, the, the differentials between those two contracts could be could be wildly different. And, uh, you know, the same with stocks and the same with, you um, uh, even shipping rates, etc. There's just any information you can get um, by what's linked to oil is is going to be is going to help your it's going to help your view. And, and so I wouldn't really narrow it down to anything in particular, other than uh, this kind of flow concept of market making. What I'm seeing, um, but you know, my advice to someone who was trading from a retail perspective is, you know, you can never do enough reading, and there's plenty out there. As I say, it's becoming more and more transparent. And it's not, you know, even for myself, when I say I've got a big edge from market making, you know, a lot of this stuff that I ultimately see does find its way into into the press. Uh, but of course, your access to that to that press, you know, there is Google and that's obviously free, but then there's Platts and Argus that are pricing agencies that price a lot of these swaps and these physically linked contracts. They have their own commentary and their own, um, the, the, they report cargo fixes, et cetera. Of course, you do have to pay for that information. So there is that slight barrier. You know, it's, it's obviously expensive. Um, but that's that type of thing is crucial as well. And then finally, you know, I'm talking to people. That's something that I've been doing on a consistent basis. I need to know what everyone else is thinking. And uh, even if it's not going to lead anywhere in terms of precisely what's going on, it's at least going to tell me what, generally speaking, how what people are thinking and how they're positioned. And then going back to this herd idea, you know, if you're, you think oil was a buy and you're starting to believe it and it's already gone up, but you still think it's a buy and then you go around and you can't find a single person who's bearish oil, you know, you know it's a pretty dangerous. So you need to start watching out. And, you know, the, the, there's a lot of people who trade oil in the futures market, you know, thousands and thousands of participants. But in the swaps um, and the kind of more physically dom uh, dominated areas, there's not that many people who, who ultimately have a big say in the price. So staying on top of those people is 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 uh, what they're thinking is is huge. Uh, like an event like uh, next week, we have a um, IP week, which is the um, International Petroleum Week. You know, pretty much uh, everyone in the oil market go, comes to London, and there's you know event after event and meetings after meetings from people from physical derivatives, you name it, who are all there essentially to as a platform to discuss maybe deals or maybe just analysis or. But it's, it's, it's a particularly important event. You know, something usually comes out of it, like a consensus or at least more information, et cetera. 
Well, just a couple questions to bounce off that and then we'll wrap this up. But uh, you said uh, earlier in your answer there that refinery profits were like a really key factor, which is something which is uh, quite valuable to know. For example, refinery profits, where would you find out about that sort of information? So as I say, you know, that that, that information um – the most accurately accurate available information you'd have to pay for. I mean, it's accessible, but um, you know, Reuters, for instance, you, you can uh, access uh, their refinery margin page, uh, and that will that will give you like daily updates. But we also do model it ourselves because we know the way the refinery profit will work is it was just you know it's the difference between where they can sell or forward hedge uh, the prices of the products they'll produce from running crude versus the price of crude. So we can run our own, you know, really accurate uh, refinery margin model and determine if they're making money or not, because it's not as simple as everyone's making money or everyone's not. There's different types of refiners. There's different types of crudes, which yield different types of uh, products. And, it, you know, th- this is all hugely variable and you have to have an underlying understanding of that um, and how these things break down to really properly analyze it. But, you know, you'll know, pretty soon if it's if on the extreme. So if the refineries are really making a lot of money, it's, it's hard for that not to get into the news, I'd say, even on Google, et cetera, just by Googling that. And the same for if it was to be heavily negative. It's, it's, it's unlikely they're going to be vary from those two extremes too much. So you're talking about little incremental gains, which will kind of make the difference for, for myself. Okay. And then the other thing being like the swaps market, obviously that's off limits pretty much to the majority of retail traders, uh, pretty much every retail trader. Um, Is it possible to actually just get market data for the swaps market or some sort of insight, uh, you know, even if you have to pay a little bit for that, like is that, what I'm trying to ask here is even if you don't actually want to get involved and actually trade in that market, is it possible to somehow get a glimpse into what's going on there? Absolutely. I mean, even if you Googled right now, you know, um, you you would just need to be specific about, you know, if you typed in data Brent prices or, you know, for instance, the European gasoline is EBOB. So type EBOB prices, and there'll, be, there'll be things there that would show you these things are reported on a day to day basis. Um, the most surefire way to get it is to pay some money for either Platts or Argus subscriptions where they publish this um, information and they even have their own analysis of it. Um, but yeah, as I say, that needs, you need to subscribe to that. But it's relatively accessible and uh, that will tell you what you need to know. Okay, cool. All right, Greg, well, let's uh, let's leave it here. Um, I want to say- Oh, sorry. Can I just quickly, uh, that if you've got a Bloomberg terminal as well, if that's something you know you can obviously buy. Bloomberg has a bigger uh, list of um, swaps prices in oil as well. Uh, so that, that that's that's a relatively easy one. And Reuters as well. So it's not just, yeah, but Bloomberg, Reuters, Platts and Argus is, is the subscriptions you'd need to really know what was going on in the source market. Okay. Bloomberg is also, what, two and a half grand a month? <laughs> I, I know, I know. That's the problem, isn't it? So. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it is what it is. Uh, Greg, mm. thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Uh, this is this has been really enjoyable and um, I've learned a few things. It's been uh, a bit different from previous conversations. And, uh, no, great. No, I've really enjoyed it. Cool. Uh, if someone did want to follow along or connect with you somehow, uh, is there anywhere they should go online? With me personally? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, just LinkedIn is probably the best way. Okay. Uh, Greg Newman. And you've got a website for Onyx as well. Do you want to mention that? Yeah, it's just uh, www.onyxcommodities.com. That's uh, relatively straightforward. There's some information there on how to get in touch with us as a company, yeah. Excellent. All right, once again, appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. Oh, 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 oh